I was the last holdout in the Catholic Church that uh, my family went to. Now, my, my mom went all the way through, but see, everybody dropped off at different times. My dad dropped off, but he was very patient. He went to church with, with our family. My family was wonderful. I grew up in a very wonderful family. We went to a Catholic church, that's true, and my dad knew it was all a bunch of hogwash. He never said it, though, but he went to keep the family together, and he loved my mom. And so he went and he sat there and he knelt and he stood and he knelt and he stood and he sat and and he knew it was crapola. We didn't know. My sister and I didn't know until years later. My sister left. Well, I think my dad left eventually. We, we had grown up and he said, well, that's enough for me. The kids are grown up. I'm bailing out. So then at least my mom still had my sister and me. Then my sister bailed out. and But at least my mom still had me, good old Martin. And then when I was about... 18, I came out of St. John's Catholic Church in Canton, Ohio, and I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to come here anymore. So I, when I look back at that, my, my mom and dad are both dead now, but when I look back, I do feel bad for my mom because she had to feel like the Lone Ranger then. Everybody had left. You know, it's like eventually all the Beatles are going to be dead except one. You know, George has died, John has died, Paul and Ringo are left. Can you imagine being the last beetle that, that'd be kind of a horrifying thing and i thought i think for my mom it was rough and i look back and i feel bad but i couldn't do anything else um anyway i'm going to be telling you about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together today we're going to get to hebrews 10 25 because this is the verse that is used to guilt people to keep people in the organized assembly when actually the organized assembly i know this now and i was finding it out when i was 18 is detrimental to spiritual well being. It really is. Anytime you institutionalize the truth, anytime truth digs a basement, it soon disappears. The truth does. And all that's left is a shell. If the truth was there at all, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt. But if the truth is there at all, as soon as it becomes an organization, we were just talking about this the other night at a home Bible study here, that um, as soon as something becomes official or formal, or you start to put a name to it. People used to tell me, why don't you put a name on, on your building? When I did the uh, the Zender talks from that um, from the building in downtown Greenwich, Ohio. Martin, why don't you put a sign out there? Because everything God's doing today is freelance. And he's not working through organizations or movements. He's moving and working through people, through individuals. And Paul pass this word on. Paul said, pass this on to faithful men. Not faithful organizations, not faithful 5013Cs, not faithful governments. It's faithful people. And that, that you see, it's so tempting when you tell this truth to people, you want them to think you're cool. You want to be um, accepted, but you're simply not going to be. Because this is the way God's always done it. The truth has always been on the outside of the institution. The truth has always been weird by the popular standards. It's always been on the fringe. And the only reason I know this is because that's the scriptural precedent. It's never been any different. You look at the days of the prophets, you look at Jesus' day, you look at Paul, and now look at our day. And we think suddenly, well, we live in a modern day. Therefore, God is developing His program. Therefore, God is in these magnificent multi-million dollar cathedrals and buildings? No! He's no more in it now than he was then. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And, and, and so the thing is, though, everybody wants to have that legitimacy to their organization. And so you want people to think you're cool. You want people to think you're with it. And But none of these men of God, we were talking about this the other night, none of these men of God, let's start with Paul. Paul said his expression was contemptible. This guy was not an orator. Oh, that reminds me of a story. Do you know that before Abraham Lincoln spoke at Gettysburg, there was a guy, he was a famous orator. I should look up his name for you, but he was like um, Abraham Lincoln's, um, what do you call the group that comes on before the big stars? The warm-up? The leading group, the warm-up group or whatever. Abraham Lincoln had a warm-up band. He had an opening act. That's what I want. And this guy, his name was Everett. Last name was Everett. And this guy was long-winded. He spoke for like an hour and a half. 
He just talked, and it was a hot day at Gettysburg, and people were dying. Nobody remembers a single word of what this guy said, but he was a trained, polished orator. Then here comes Abraham Lincoln with his stove pipe hat, and he's wandering up. No, he didn't wander up. He kind of shuffled up to the stage with his head down, red from a napkin that he wrote on on the train. The Gettysburg Address, it lasted for maybe two and a half minutes. Immortal words. Immortal words. Because it's the words, not the delivery, not the polish, not the institution, not the reputation. It's the message. Jesus said that if you shut down all these people, the stones themselves will cry out. That's why I know this, and it's very humbling to realize that you're nothing. I'm, I'm nothing. It's the words. I just happen to be a broken vessel. God happens to be using me. Well, okay, he also spoke through an ass at one time. He's just spoken, he's speaking through a different ass now. But it's his way, and Paul was, his delivery was detestable. And he didn't have a polished um, speaking manner. And our Lord Jesus Christ didn't either. Go to YouTube. I was on YouTube recently, and they they what they did is, they took the face of Jesus Christ and, uh, well, let's say, they, they looked at how people, they studied literature from Jesus' time and they found out what people generally look like and they studied um, some fossils, some, some bones from that day and they reconstructed what they thought Jesus Christ probably looked like. And it's scary. It's scary. I saw this. I, I'll, I'll find out what to type in on YouTube to find it. Type in maybe face of of Jesus Christ, but when you see what he possibly looked like, they acknowledge he had short hair, which is contrary to all the popular images you see of Jesus Christ, um, and he looked like the the typical Jew of the day, not a beautiful man, but we know this from Isaiah 53, he had nothing about him that would draw us to him, so this whole longing to belong, we long to belong, but I'm telling you, if you do belong, you don't have the truth, if you do belong, if you're in a cozy little organized group that you can be proud of and that people will look and say, well, look, that's legitimate. It's bona fide. It's recognized by the government or recognized by the populace. Talking about the Joel Osteens or the Billy Grahams. These people are recognized. They have honor, honor of other men. They have praise. They have a reputation. Therefore, I mean, it's a formula. Therefore, they don't have truth. And we always say, we look at the conferences we teach at, and we see maybe 30 people. In Faith, North Carolina, we had 80 people. We were getting nervous. Wow, 80 people, wow. And um, I've heard Clyde say, and I've said it too, if I looked out at an audience at a conference, and I saw 200 people, we'd have to ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Something very screwy going on around here. So... We don't have any problem with that as long as we straight stay true to the message. But I have actually been accused of getting too slick. You know, I try to make my book covers look nice, and I try to typeset my books professionally. And people say, Zender, you're getting too slick. And uh, all I know is this, is I do the best I can. We're not going to try to make ourselves look stupid. God does that and well enough without us trying to do it. You don't have to try to look dumb, Okay. God's going to make sure you look dumb. Don't compound it by attempting to do it yourself. God will take care of it. You, you do your best, and if you have the message, I guarantee you won't end up being famous. Clyde said, this is funny, Clyde has told me he has had many people tell him, Clyde, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give half the money to you. you know. And Clyde just says, you poor person, that guarantees you're never going to win the lottery. The fact that you said you're going to give it to me, you're never going to win it. Just leave me out of it and you might have a chance. But as soon as you say, I'm going to give some to Zender, or I'm going to give some to Sheridan, or I'm going to give some to Clyde Pilkington, you're doomed. You're never going to win the lottery because God is going to make sure that none of us become famous. We, we may be well known in certain circles, very you know limited circles within the, uh, within the body of Christ. Certain of us have... A reputation. Paul had a reputation in the body of Christ. He was a teacher and his name became associated with his message. Nothing wrong with that. But if you look at the the big picture you find out that's a very very limited group 
of people. And I will give you my estimate right now on the air. I will do this live right here today. I will tell you my estimate of how many people I think are in the body of Christ today. I have no, absolutely no facts to base this on. This is pure conjecture. It's not scripture. I have no formula. Well, I do have a little bit of a formula for you. In Romans chapter 11, Paul's talking about um, Elijah. And Elijah, um, in Elijah's day, thought that he was the only one who was left. You remember, Elijah was lamenting before God. He said, God, they've torn down your altars. They've killed the prophets. I alone am left. And don't you feel that way in your little corner of the world? I'm the only person that believes this. Where is everybody? It's like, hello, hello, hello. Are there any other members, members of the body of Christ, Christ, Christ? And Elijah did the same thing. And God told him, I have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000. Now that was not, I don't know how many people were in Israel in the days of Elijah, but 7,000 was a small number. Seven is a number of, of perfection. And so, based on that, very loosely based on that, I have a feeling, that's all it is, that there are no more than 5,000 people alive today in the body of Christ. And the reason I say five, five is the number of grace, and Paul's is a message of, of grace. And from my view, I mean, we, we're on the internet and we can see things. We don't know who are believers. We have a good idea. People don't like when I say that. Whenever I start talking about what is a believer, people don't like it. Because, Martin, you're making a judgment. Well, yeah, we're supposed to know who believers are. For one reason, Paul says, don't become unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So you must be able to know what an unbeliever is. Anyway, as I scan the horizon, you get on the Internet, you see who has the truth. You see certain websites rising to the top who actually have the truth and the people who are listening to them. And of those people... Many are hangers-on. There's only a very few core group. And so I think it's generous to say that there are 5,000 people alive today in the body of Christ. Now, there could be hundreds of thousands that have died that are going to rise with the living. Remember, when Jesus Christ returns, the living and the dead are both going to be changed. The dead are going to rise first. And it could be a lot of people there because you have... Look, you have the number of people from all ages, starting with Paul. But those who are alive at the snatching, well, I think is a very few people. And the only way this becomes an acceptable teaching is if you understand the plan of God, that it's not God's purpose to save everyone now. It's God's purpose to save everyone at, at the consummation. So knowing that, you all of a sudden don't have to squeeze a bunch of people into the faith that don't belong there, obviously don't belong there. You don't have to lower the bar of truth to get them in. You can keep the standard of truth high, and you can finally state the obvious, that these people just aren't believers. People don't see what we see. No credit to us. They just don't see it. And there's not many of us. It's not bragging, because God chooses the unwise, unwise weak, ignoble, and stupid. So how would it be bragging to say that we're members of the body of Christ? You just cut yourself down. You just made yourself unwise, weak, ignoble, and stupid. Congratulations, you're a member of the body of Christ. And um, so, I didn't even get to, <laughs> I didn't even get to the scriptures. Sorry, I really got off on a tangent and I stayed there. Start talking about church. So, tomorrow, I promise, I told you I was going to clean up loose ends from Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 18. I'm going to read a little excerpt from A. E. Knox Concordant Commentary on the New Testament. And then I promise I'm going to get to um, Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. The verse that has been used to guilt you into going to church or make you feel really bad for having quit church. You shouldn't feel bad because if you've seen the hypocrisy, if you've smelled the hypocrisy in the church, then you have... Find spiritual intuition. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise.